Louis St. Just in 1793 was the president of the Jacobin Club. Now, what did we just say? The Jacobin Club was the name of the Illuminati in France. He was the president of this group in France. He was also a member of the Committee of Public Safety. Now, I hope that you have a committee like that here. Do you have a Committee of Public Safety in Highland or the community you live in? He was the chairman of the, not, he was a member. He was the president of the Jacobin Club and a member of the Committee of Public Safety. They believed in France, he and his group in the Jacobin Club, we must establish a unitary republic embracing all of France. Now we'll talk more about different kinds of republics. A unitary republic is not a compound republic. It's just the opposite. It's a simple republic. In Utah, in March of this year, the state legislature passed a law and they determined at the state legislature what kind of a republic we have. Who can tell me the, the official title that they gave our form of government at the Utah State Legislature just a few weeks ago? A, oh, absolutely not democratic. <laughs> no, no, that was the big debate and it started in Alpine School District. I was there the night it opened up the can of worms. Good thing they know how to edit film. <laughs> I was there, maybe some of you, any of you there that night when they had the can of worms over at the Alpine School District headquarters and they talked about enculturating the young into our social and political democracy. Were you there? No, but I heard much oh my, that was an interesting evening. And, and we, we, we had a kind of a knockdown, drag out discussion and it went on for weeks and weeks and weeks afterwards in the local newspapers and the parents contesting, it's still going on. No peace has been, been arrived at. But the legislature took it up and they decided that we should teach in the schools the kind of government we have. And they determined in the legislature, that must be true if they voted on it and approved it. And they determined we are a compound constitutional republic. Now that's the opposite of a unitary republic. A compound republic is a republic made up of republics. Use coercion as necessary. What did our founding fathers say when they organized this compound constitutional republic? Was this to be by coercion? No, it was just the opposite. It says in the Declaration of Independence that we depend on the consent of the governed. It's voluntary if you join this compound constitutional republic. These are two contending forces. This is a direct quote from Mr. St. Just. You should detect and combat federalism in, in your institutions as your natural enemy to a grand central establishment for all the work of the unitary republic is an efficacious means against federalism. Now what kind of a government did our founding fathers create? A compound constitutional republic which was a federal government. Now most people don't grasp the concept they didn't create, they purposely revoked and threw out the idea of a national government. They wanted nothing to do with a national government. It took them a long time at the convention. First they passed 26 motions voting into place a national program. This was at the Convention of States in 1787. 26 times they had voted on separate resolutions and they were going to have national this and national that and national something else. And then as the four and a half months of debate continued, one at a time, they started rejecting these concepts of having national this and national that. And they voted all 26 of them out, one issue at a time. And they created a federal government. Really? Is there a difference? I mean, aren't they the same thing? No. Federation and what do we call that previous one? A unitary republic are quite different. Now, St. Just had a flag. This is the flag of France at that time. And they had a slogan. And the slogan was, Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité. Ah, beautiful statement. Liberty, Equality, and Brotherhood. I mean, aren't we all for that? Let's take a look and see what they, they meant by those words. He says we need a grand central establishment. Central, meaning we're gonna have one powerful national government control all of France. 
Egality is a little bit more complex than just simple equality. It's, a, it's an extreme leveling of society, political, social, and economic equality. We're going to bring everybody down to the same level so that you're all enjoying equality. I mean, isn't that wonderful? Are you thrilled with the idea? <laughs> this was what they were going to do in France. Now, they wanted national sovereignty, and I, I wish we had time to give you all the lessons in the series, but we don't. You, you know, you take till midnight tonight. But national sovereignty is what we have today in the United States. That's what they're exercising. But we should not have national sovereignty. We should have state sovereignty, and you can't have them together. In spite of what scholars like Justice Scalia say, we cannot have dual sovereignty. It does not work. It's impossible. But nevertheless, they wanted national sovereignty in France. And this was the poster that they hung around France to encourage all of this to go on. And on that poster it says, oh, by the way, behind the poster is a significant symbol. Can you tell what that is from what you see on there? Can you see the symbol? The bottom of it's here, the top of it's there. It's wrapped with a blood red cord. It's a bundle of sticks wrapped with a blood red cord. And if you see it, it looks like this. What is that? That's the sign of the Roman Empire. That's the symbol of Caesar. And when Caesar was taken down the parade route, in front of him would be a standard bearer carrying this symbol of power. It's the symbol of the states bound together by coercion, a battle ax tied to the side, and this is how we'll run our country. This is national sovereignty expressed by a symbol. Well, that's the symbol here in this French placard or this French poster. And the words on the poster are, one united, indivisible republic with liberty, equality, and brotherhood, or death. Okay? <laughs> this is the French approach to, to the kind of government they thought would be the best form of government. They meaning Louis St. Just and Adam Weishaupt and the Illuminati. This is the way they wanted it. This is Satan's plan. This is the coercive plan of the old deluder. Now, Louis St. Just was, was a part of the Committee on Safety. And the Committee on Safety was respo responsible, to responsible to protect the society. And so they had this look around and they had to decide what was a threat to the society. Well, Louis St. Just was one of several on this committee, and the, the majority of the committee would decide who was a, a violation of their you know, pr program. One day they decided St. Just was. And so they said, uh, today we're going to vote, and they decided to have Robespierre and St. Just both have their heads lopped off on the same day because they were not carrying out the plan effectively for liberty, equality, and brotherhood, or death. And so they, they got the or death part of that. So that happened on July of 19, uh, 1794. They put St. Just in the guillotine along with Robespierre and a few others, and they lopped a few, many others, and they lopped off their heads. Now, why are we studying this French history? Because we're doing the same thing here. We just don't use the guillotine. <laughs> the secret society after St. Just, after he was killed, his followers went on and they created the League of the Just. Now you know where the name comes from. It's St. Just, it's his league. And they're ca carrying on the principles of the Illuminati coming through the Jacobin Club. Which father are we following? Let's continue. All men are brothers became their slogan. Now here we have this great sounding thing. All, are you my brother? Brother Pratt, somebody. I heard that name today. Somebody called me Brother Pratt. All men are brothers. Well, that's a wonderful slogan, unless it's Satan that's promoting it. <laughs> okay, in this case it is. They changed their name in 1847 to the Communist League. Oh, now you've heard of that. We're getting up closer to home now. Well, the Communist League approached Karl Marx and asked him and his associate, Mr. Engels, to create a manifesto for them. Write down and express how we feel about the things around us. And so he became known as the father of state communism. Now, it's, it's you know, the college professors that talk about Marxism, they want to differentiate. Oh, Marx had a wonderful program. It was those guys after him that violated the great principles of Karl Marx. And uh, I say, well, let's get into this and just talk about this some more. <laughs> so we, we put in the word state communism so that we don't say he's the father of communism like we think of, you know, 
who are the vicious communists that go around killing people like Mao and uh, uh, Stalin, and, you know, killing millions of people. Oh, no, no, Karl Marx wasn't like that, they say. No. Well, <clears throat> okay. He believed in democracy. Democracy is the first step to socialism, he wrote. So when we talked about enculturating the young into our social and political democracy, that's the slogan that was in the past tense, was on the wall of the Alpine School District. I hear they've taken it down since I photographed it. If, if they're gonna have democracy like that, all they're doing is promoting the programs of the Illuminati. If we go back and use an early term, oh no, we're not doing that, they would say over here at the school district headquarters. They would deny that vigorously. We're not doing that. Well, let's look at the details. Another thing that he put into this communist manifesto, we should abolish countries and nationalities. Now what's all this talk at G20 I hear on the news this morning? What are they trying to do in Europe? What are they trying to do around the world? What's this thing called the new world order that's being put into place? That's just Karl Marx's program, going back earlier to the Illuminati. Free education for all children in public schools. That's the direct quote out of this literature coming from the Marxist Illuminati. Free public education for all children in public schools. Oh no, no, we don't follow the Communist Manifesto. No, our public schools aren't like that. Really? <laughs> How about this one? Enforce a graduated income tax. Now, has anybody in here questioned that that happened? No, oh, we all know April 15th's coming around again. <laughs> there were many more points that he put in. We embraced them all. All of the principles in one way or another of the Communist Manifesto were put into effect in America. And it didn't start with uh, Franklin Roosevelt. And it didn't start with Woodrow Wilson. It goes way back before that when we started embracing them. How many of you have read the Communist Manifesto? Oh, good for you. Let's leave half the group. You're really a different kind of an audience. <laughs> if we ask that, you know, if we stop the people out here on the street, everybody that went by, and we ask them, I bet you there wouldn't be one out of a hundred that had ever read it. Because you came because you have something in your heart that says, I need to know more about liberty. The Communist Manifesto helps us to understand the thinking of the opposite viewpoint than liberty. The new names of communism, as soon as the communist word became a kind of a trigger word and wasn't too uh, you know, acceptable around the world, the communist parties began renaming themselves. The first one to change its name was the East German Communist Party. And I remember reading the news on this that many years ago, you know, what, 20, something like that, about the, just before the Berlin Wall came down or right after it, they decided they had to change their name. They couldn't be called the Communist Party. That was, that was not an acceptable term anymore. And so they immediately changed to the Party of Democratic Socialism. Isn't that a great name? Enculturating the young into the Party of Democratic Socialism. That's what that means, that slogan. Bulgarian Communist Party changed their name to the Socialist Party. The Hungarian Communist Party changed to the Socialist Party. The Poland of, in Poland, it was called the Poland United Workers Party. That was the Communist Party. They became the Social Democratic Party. Romanian Communist Party became the National Salvation Front. In Yugoslavia, they changed to the Democratic Renewal Party. In Croatia, they changed to the Party of Democratic Change. Do you, do you see a trend here? All of these groups are gonna be social democrats, enculturating our group into the social and democratic concepts. And I think we have a few more. The new names of communism, Serbian League of Communists became the Serbian Socialist Party. The Turkmenistan Communist Party became the Democratic Party. Lithuania, I mean, I don't want to bore you or anything, but they all changed their name. That's the point here. Lithuania, nobody wanted to be called a communist anymore because that was a dirty word. So now we have these nice social words like social democrats and democrats and so on. There are Modovian to the agrarian democratic party. They wanted to relate to the farmers. That was important, like state farm insurance. Do you think there are any farmers in the state farm insurance company, you know, that run the company? Uh, Farmers Mutual, that's another insurance name. 
Are there any farmers running that business? I seriously doubt it. <laughs> I think that word farm had something to do with making you feel close to the land. The agrarian Democratic Party. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm not sure when the list ends. How many slides do I have of this? The Democratic Party. Oh, I like this one. The Soviet KGB became a bad word, and so they then changed their name to the Federal Security Force or service, federal security. Isn't that a great idea? We're gonna have federal security and a service. We're gonna provide you with a service. Well, okay, let's go to Marion Romney for a moment. I loved and respect him when he was around. I was still alive then. By the extent to which we tolerate communism, accommodate ourselves to it, permit ourselves to be encircled by its tentacles and drawn to it, to that extent, we forfeit the protection of the God of this land. Now, he's likening this to tentacles. So I created this octopus, and I put some of the tentacles of these social democratic programs on the octopus. Okay, I've labeled the tentacles. They want the government to control the land. They want the government to control the industry. They want government control of communications and credit, the banks and so on. They want the government to control that. They want the government to control the insurance, you know, like Medicare and Medicaid and Obamacare and on down the long list, workman's compensation and so forth. They want the government to control that. They want the government to establish and maintain a minimum wage and increase it frequently. They want free education for all children in public schools. They want to downgrade the family like seven states or six states right now have approved same-sex marriage in the, you know, for a relationship. They want to downgrade the family, and they certainly want to reduce the significance of religion. Is there anything you've heard lately about the white crosses on the highways in Utah? Yeah, we can't have white crosses. An atheist might drive by that cross and it will affect his life. You know, it's going to upset and disturb him. He'll have emotional trauma and need to see a psychiatrist. This is going on right now in Utah. The moral basis of a free society. He gives us some points that are worth reviewing. There are four elements of freedom. Life and some degree of physical and mental health and strength. The absence of restraint and coercion by others. The right and control of property knowledge of those laws which must be obeyed to achieve one's goals. Now that's fancy language. Let's put it in the simple language that we all understand. There are four elements of freedom. Life, liberty, property, but the fourth one we haven't usually reflected upon. The fourth element is just as important as the other three. We must have the access to the truth. And if we don't know the truth, we may act inappropriately and think we're on the right track. And that's where most of the good people of the, of the country are in, that's my opinion. Especially when the Alpine School District showed me 200 angry parents and a board of directors confronting each other on the subject of whether or not we have a social democracy as a form of government. My, oh my. Knowledge. What did this man say? That's Thomas Jefferson with his red hair. Pick an illustration that you haven't seen before. What did he say that's significant about knowledge? And we hear it hopefully over and over. Hopefully you've got it memorized. If a nation expects to be ignorant and free, it expects what never was and never will be. I think we got it about right there. If a nation expects to be ignorant and free, we need knowledge. We need to know the truth and the truth will set us free. Beware of three dangers that threaten from within. Now this came out a long time ago by the leaders of my church. And I promise you when I first heard it, it didn't really make much sense. It just was interesting. I, you know, like I listened to it in general conference and think, oh, isn't that beautiful? To my wife and my family, isn't it wonderful to be here listening to these great men speak these wonderful messages? I'm sure I didn't grasp what they were talking about. We have different levels that we come in on and we must improve upon what we know. I did, I worked on it. Flattery bothered me. I didn't know what flattery was. I thought flattery was like, you know, when, 
Oh, when Red Riding Hood went in and saw the wolf sitting there and says, my, my mother, what big eyes you have, or something like that, you know. Flattery was when you told somebody something about how they looked, and, and, and oh, you have such beautiful hair, and you didn't really mean it. That's what I thought flattery was. I couldn't, couldn't connect it to what they were speaking about. And then I started researching flattery. I read every reference on flattery in the scriptures. There's not that many, try it sometime. Look up in the concordance or look it up on your, you know, some other method and read them all. Here a couple of samples are. He shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Have you ever heard a smooth talking politician promise something that they wouldn't, wouldn't deliver? When I'm elected, we'll have change, or whatever they may happen to say, okay? This is flattery, and this is the kind they're warning us about. Beware of three dangers that threaten from within. Another use in the scriptures, a flattering mouth worketh ruin. Beware of three dangers. Noah Webster's dictionary in 1828 defined flattery as smooth talk. And you know, that's my profession is a blacksmith. And in the dictionary, it says it comes from the word flatter, which is a noun. Now, a flatter is a blacksmith's tool, and it's a very smooth, polished face, like looks like a hammer, but you don't swing it. You lay it on your hot metal, and you strike it with a hammer. And it has a very smooth, polished face, and it makes the metal flatter. And so they call it a flatter. That's the name of the tool. And so Noah Webster, he explains all of that in his 1828 dictionary, which I own and enjoy very much. And so he says, from the word flatter comes the word smooth talk or flattery. So now I'm starting to catch on. Flattery is smooth talk. It sounds good, but it isn't true. Let me give you some examples of flatterers. This is a flatterer, Walter Durante. Anybody ever hear him before? Well, Walter Durante was a Pulitzer Prize winner. He was writing from the Soviet Union the story, the true story, of course, of what was going on in the Soviet Union and what a wonderful paradise it really is. This is back in the 20s and 30s. Well, meanwhile, what was really going on in the Soviet Union? Well, people like Lenin and Stalin were murdering their own inhabitants by the millions. And this geek, my wife says, don't use words like that. <laughs> this less than desirable character, he was writing lies and he was sending them to the, be published in America in the New York Times and he received a Pulitzer Prize because of the excellent material that he sent from the Soviet Union. Now this is an example of a flatterer, smooth talker, smooth talk. Here's another one that was gifted at flattery. Who is that? Do you recognize that face? You all know who that is. Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And if there was anything he was gifted at, it was lying. Lie, lie, lie. Do you want to see documentation on it so that you feel comfortable? Ah, there's plenty of it. I can send you the book, the email. Illusion of Victory and other books give you some numerous examples of his continuous lying. He would come on the air, that's what the microphones are here, and he would tell the American people something that was just not true, just absolute false. And it was years later when we finally woke up and those that wanted to woke up and found out that he had done that. A flatterer, a smooth talker. Here's another one that was a smooth talker. Who's that? That's Dwight Eisenhower. Now this, this is amazing because I was there when he did it. I was 12 years old. And I stood there with awe, looking with my eye like Ike button on. Not, I, I, and he flattered the people. And he became president. And he continued to flatter them. Smooth talk. Who's this? Did he ever flatter the people? With smooth talk? It goes on, we can give you numerous examples. Books have been written about it. The Spin of George Bush, and things like that, <laughs> the books. Who's this? Has he ever flattered the people with smooth talk? Now, the flatterers are abundant, and they have lots of smooth talk to share, and it sounds so good. There are three dangers. The second one is false educational ideas. 
Now these people that are skilled in flattery will tell you things that just aren't true, but they're believable. I mean, it sounds so good, you say, well, oh, yeah, we better act on that. That's, what's, that's, what, well, that's the way it is. Oh, this, 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 this to hang on on a minute here, do you? The false educational ideas, the example I gave, uh, you, you saw the flash of there, one of the false educational ideas that has caused great damage to our country is illustrated with is, this illustration. Now, what is that? Slime. Slime. That's what it is. Well, what's that got to do with false educational ideas? That's a picture of your great-great-grandmother. <laughs> you didn't know I knew what she looked like, did you? Is that you, Grandma? Are we just a, simply a product of chance plus slime plus time? Yeah. That's what they tell us. This is a photograph right out of my local high school biology textbook. Yeah, this is where we came from, students. You were once a slime, and now you're here. Here's another one out of the high, same, same biology textbook. This is the picture of where we came from. We were a product of random chance. Far out, they say, far out. Let's see what the next slide is. No, we're gonna go back. Far out in the universe, I was told. This one, I was a kid. Far out in the universe, there were molecules roaming around, and they bumped into each other, and they fell into a tepid primeval sea. And after eons of infinite time, a lizard crawled out from under a rock, and that was your great-great-grandmother. <laughs> now, you all heard this in some version, you know. As, am I telling a lie? No, you all heard it somewhere. This is where you came from. This was one of the most devastating false educational ideas because it changed our entire legal system. Because the lawyers started saying, this is the big, big whoopee-ups at the top, they started saying, well, gee, if we evolve from a slime, then the law's got to evolve also. What was true yesterday will be false tomorrow, and what was false yesterday will be true tomorrow. <laughs> we'll evolve the law. That's what they did. Well, let's see, I was in the state prison for a while on assignment from Cleon Skousen. He said, I want you to do a report on the prison system. It was an interesting experience. I went there every night for a week and spent eight hours. One of the inmates was an artist, and I said, would you draw a picture or two for me? Oh yeah, I'm happy to, I got lots of time. <laughs> and so he started drawing, he drew a whole stack of pictures over the next week or two. I said, I want you to draw a picture of somebody that has no self-worth, they just think they're a product of random chance coming from a piece of slime. Oh, he says, that's easy. That's just a common street criminal. So this is a common street criminal from Salt Lake City, according to the artist in the prison, and I, I, I thought he did good. This is a man that has no self-esteem. He has no self-worth. And he is, he, he's willing to participate and engage in all sorts of activities, and so his cousin comes to visit him because he was taught that his cousin was just a monkey and so forth. Hey, buddy, let's go out and have a good time on the town tonight. <laughs> So this is, this is what happened. The chief justice, uh, one of the justices, I don't remember if he was chief, one of the most prominent justices of the Supreme Court, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., wrote, I see no reason for attributing to man a significance different in kind from that which belongs to a baboon or a grain of sand. Really? That's one of the most prominent justices of the Supreme Court telling you what your net worth is. Just like a baboon or a grain of sand. Social Darwinism was born. Now this is a false educational idea that was adopted by the courts and the court system. Social Darwinism was born, and this shows a picture of the Warren Court and many of the decisions they made that changed the course of America. They should have been impeached and removed from office, but they were ignored. In fact, not ignored, their, their doctrines were embraced and promoted. Here's an example, one of those men was Justice Brennan, and he's throwing the Constitution in the trash can in this political caricature, and he says, this junk was obviously written by a bunch of right-wing kooks. 
Have you ever had the feeling, if you bring the Constitution up in a subject, that you're extremist and a right-wing kook? Yes, yes you have. You've all had that experience. Beware of three dangers. The third one is sexual impurity. By the way, all this goes back to the vice helped and the Illuminati and the thinking of evil conspiring men. The third one is a direct result of the first two. Who's this man? Ever seen that face before? They made a movie about him not too long ago, about how wonderful a contributor, a great, great hero this man is. Anybody in this room know who this man is? Kinsey, Alfred Kinsey. Thank you, sir. Alfred Kinsey. Well, what's his contribution? If we gave him a title, if we could call him the father of something, what's he the father of? The father of the sexual revolution. The father of sexual perversion is what I call him. He's a pervert, and he became a prominent man, and they give him great credit for his wonderful contribution to society. Alfred Kinsey, father of sexual perversion. I made that up. I've never heard anybody else call him that, but to me, he is the father of sexual perversion. And if, if Adam Weishaupt were here today, he would be smiling <laughs> as he looked down upon Alfred Kinsey's work. Dirty Joe Punster. Have you ever seen that sign before? Or one similar? Yeah, in the fact, there's one at each end of Utah County. Now, I understand these signs cost thousands of dollars a month. And it's right out there in plain sight. It's been there for years and years. Every once in a while, they upgrade it and change it to a different picture. It's just right at the end of both sides of Utah County. Dirty Joe Punsters, lingerie and adult novelties. He's been there since 1990, he claims. Hmm. One of my friends lives next door to his store, and he doesn't have much nice to say about it. This is the sexual impurity on the edges of your community advertising to get you to spend your money, and somebody has to keep this store going and pay for the sign. And those somebodies are not the tourists from out of town. Dirty Joe Punster's sign will be very pleasing. Who's this guy? Kinsey, Alfred Kinsey. I put the smiles on their faces. I told you, I, I, I go, Google up smiling faces. And I pull those lips out and put them on these guys. And they would both be very pleasing. Who's this guy? Yeah, get those names into your thinking so that you can spout them out. You can talk the, the people's names. The father of sexual perversion. The father of, oh, he's the grandfather of modern socialism. That's a title that some of the scholars give to uh, Adam Weishaupt. They would be so pleased to see Dirty Joe Punster's business going. The American War Casualties. Many years ago, I saw this chart, and I, I thought it was impressive, and I put it into my first lecture on which father are you following. The American War Casualties. During the Revolutionary War, 25,324 American soldiers died, and they give that one, one cross. Now, today we couldn't use this because, you know, the cross is an incorrect symbol. It might warp your minds. But in the old days, they used things like the cross. They represented the death of 25,000. That's what the cross represents. The Civil War took the lives of, they said in that particular essay, and I think since then they've corrected that. They said it was 498,332 soldiers. And so those crosses, at 25 crosses for each one, you have to have that many crosses. The World War I, 116,708, that's that many crosses. Uh, World War II, Korean War, Vietnam War, all terrible, terrible losses of lives. And now we've got these wars that are not even legitimate, just police actions around Iraq and Iran and Afghanistan, killing thousands of our soldiers. And so we could give a couple of crosses for those losses of life. But if we really look at the influence of sexual perversion, it's the war on the unborn since abortion was legalized in 1973 by Darwinian thinking. Well, what would that look like if we translated those deaths into crosses? Now that is not up to date. That's probably a half a page more, half a page to get enough crosses to represent the killing of the unborn children in the United States since 1973. Three things we must be aware of. Who can name what they are? 
Beware of the flattery of prominent men. Beware of and beware of sexual perversion. This is a, a, a slide of, uh, from the New American, my favorite news magazine, what Congress can do for this American. Who's this American? Can you tell it there on the slide? An unborn baby. What can Congress do for an unborn baby? They could pass the Sanctity of Life Act. This is Ron Paul's continuing effort to try and get Congress to do something to stop the heinous killing of children. Congress has the power with a simple majority vote to overturn Roe versus Wade, the court case that caused this horrible loss of life. Huh? Why haven't they done it? I called Ron, I called Ron Paul's office recently and asked the question just so I could report to the audience. I said, why haven't they done anything with the Sanctity of Life Act? What's wrong with these, these people back in Washington, these men we, and women we choose to represent us? Oh, they said, it can't even get out of committee. That means there is not a majority in the committee that believe it's worthwhile to stop killing the children. Not a majority in the committee. And so they don't even get it out of the committee to bring it onto the floor and get a vote of 51% to overturn Roe versus Wade. There's not that much interest in saving life in the United States Congress. Hmm, where are we today? Which father are we following? Now this one here, I'm going to bring it right to home. Ye do profane the Sabbath day. Nehemiah tells the story of how he was trying to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the destroyed city. And he got there and he gave a little uh, lesson to the people he gathered around. And he said, there were two things that you did that caused the city to be destroyed, that caused the destruction of Israel. And one of them was, ye do profane the Sabbath day. They didn't keep the Sabbath day holy. Really? You mean that could change the nature of our community and uh, bring devastation upon us? I didn't drive very far on State Street, not, not a mile from here. I pulled into a grocery store parking lot, just a place to park, and I started taking pictures like this. I didn't have to walk very far to look around the corner of the cars and things. I don't think I walked more than 50 feet. And here's what I got. Open Sunday, that's the grocery store I was standing in the parking lot. Store hours, open 6 a.m. to midnight daily. Dollar Tree. Open Sundays, open Sundays, open Sundays. Hmm, that's right here in downtown Oral. Ye do profane the Sabbath day. Which father are we following? Ye marry outside the faith, was the other one that Nehemiah pointed out. Ye marry outside the faith. And for those two reasons, their society was crushed by the enemies. Hmm, in Mar is marriage under siege in America today is the title of this magazine article. Now this is an old magazine. Is marriage under siege in America today? Well, what's the answer to that? Yes, here's another magazine. This magazine came out in the 1970s. Same sex marriage, will America cross the line? Have we? Yes. At least six states now embrace same-sex marriage. Now, that's current, the best I could get, like yesterday. Karl Marx in 1848. We must establish a unitary republic embracing all of Germany. Now, did you hear about that from St. Just? What did he want? A unitary republic embracing all of France. A unitary republic, you want to remember, was not a compound republic. A unitary republic means we're going to take all of the states of Germany and by coercion we're going to bundle them together and wrap them up with a blood red cord and we're going to tie a battle axe on the side. The symbol of who? Caesar. Hmm. And they had a slogan, working men of all countries unite. Now that sounds really friendly and good. Shouldn't all the working men be united? and use coercion as necessary. None of this thing like the Declaration of Independence says by the consent of the governed. No, 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 that's not by consent. If you don't like it, 
we'll force you. Ooh, la mort. What's that mean? Yeah, or death. They wanted national sovereignty. Here's a picture from the, uh, uh, that time period, uh, an illustration, Germany in 1848. Now there were actually 18 locations across Europe where this kind of unrest was going on. And they were shooting each other and stabbing each other and burning each other and throwing rocks at each other. Huh, sounds like Wall Street to me. <laughs> they haven't shot anybody that I know of there yet. That's coming. Okay, here we have the unrest in 18 locations in Europe. Karl Marx was particularly interested in, by force, combining the German states into one national government. The Communist Revolution of 1848 was a revolution fought to destroy the individual state governments of Germany and forcibly unite them under an all-powerful central socialist government. That's a summary of what was going on in 18 locations in this particular one we're referring to is Germany. Now, when those people lost, when these people lost this conflict, and they all did, by the way, all of them lost. None of the socialist revolutions in 1848 succeeded. They did not overthrow the existing government. Remember, what were the three things that Adam Weishaupt wanted to accomplish? Overthrow the existing government, destroy the Christian religion, and fill the world with a new society. <laughs> well, they tried. They were all against the Christian religion, I can assure you, also. But they didn't succeed. So what did they do? They came to America. They came to America. This illustration shows boatloads of immigrants in 1840s coming to America. And many of them would be the red revolutionaries from these socialist revolutions. Now, do you suppose that somewhere crossing the ocean, they had a change of heart? I now am a freedom-loving America. I will go and devote my cause of liberty. Do you think this happened? No, they were still communist, socialist revolutionaries looking for a safe haven where they could continue promoting their program. They had to leave the countries they were in or they'd go to jail or be executed. So here they came to America. They called the Red 48ers. That's, that's the name of a book uh, written by a professor in Montana, a professor of history. Let's see, I think that book comes up here. The cover does in a minute. And they, oh, I like this one. They became Republicans. Now this is the first Republican Party in America. They were, they were, they were, they're just, what are we, 48? They became Republicans in 56. They didn't, you know, they, I think it was 56 when the Republicans ran their first candidate for president. Wasn't he Fremont? Mr. Fremont, pretty sure that's the guy. He lost, and then four years later, the Republicans ran another candidate. Who was there stimulating, organizing, and promoting the Republican Party? These communists from the socialist revolutions in Europe. By the way, the word communist, socialist were both interchangeable terms at the time. And so they call them communist socialist in, the, in some of the literature. So these are pictures of some of these guys that became leaders in the United States. And this is the book cover. Uh, Rheinische Zeitung is the uh, German newspaper that tells the sum of the story. And the uh, professor of history, Oscar Hammond, writes The Red 48ers, Karl Marx and Frederick Engels published in 1967. Now, this is some, one of the sources that I bring to give you the background where it comes from. Here's another one. Red Republicans, Marxism in the Civil War by Kennedy and Benson. Marxism in the Civil War and Lincoln's Marxist. Now, who were Lincoln's Marxist? You mean President Lincoln? That good man that preserved liberty and saved the Constitution and freed the slaves and saved the Union? That guy? Yeah, it's the same man. When this, this book uh, was written in the year 2007, that's brand new stuff. They came up with the current research and were a few years ahead of the 1967 version. These are some of the Red Republicans. They started the Republican Party, they promoted the Republican Party, and they were all good, faithful socialist communists. Karl Schurz, Frederick Hecker, and so forth. In this book, in 1910, The Sovereignty of the States, Walter Neal points out, Alexander Hamilton begat the Federal Party. The Federal Party begat the Whig Party. The Whig Party begat the Republican Party. 
Now, that's the genealogy of the Republican Party. That is the political line through which it comes. Senator Wendell Phillips was a very outspoken and a popular leader of the Senate, and he announced the, the Republican Party is in no sense a national party. It is a party of the North organized against the South. That's the purpose of the party, is to crush the South into submission and accomplish the socialist communist goals of the radical revolutionaries and the influence they had on the leadership in the United States. Now that's about as far out of statement as you probably have heard in your lifetime. Nothing as bizarre as that has ever been spoken to your eardrums. It just happens to be true. I promised I wasn't going to hold back anything today. But we're just going to tell the truth and let it fall where it does. Now in that time period there was a group called the Wide Awake Republicans. Google it! Wide Awake Republicans. And this is one of the illustrations, if you Google images, you will see of the wide awake Republicans. These are the people campaigning for the 16th president of the United States. They're going around in 1860 in their military uniforms, and I don't think it's an accident that their acronym, W-A-R, spells war. This is what they wanted. These are the people being promoted and directed by the social do-gooders from Europe. They have a placard or a sign they carry. The sign looks like this. Can you see the sign I'm pointing out with the arrow right there? See the wide awake and then the eyeball? Looks like this. What is this? Wide awake, with a big eyeball looking out at you. One author, and I haven't found a whole lot of reading where they try to interpret the eyeball, one author says the eyeball appears to be Let's see if we've got that. It comes up in a minute. It's, it's not the all-seeing eye of God. That is not the symbol here. There's another eye that was the eye of hypocrisies or something like that, the God of secrecy. And it seems to be one author thinks that eyeball was the God of secrecy. In any event, they had a banner. Now this is a photograph from the website of the banner that's in, on exhibit in the Chicago Museum. This is the, the banner of the Republican Party. They would have hung it out in front of Abraham Lincoln when he gave his first inaugural address. They would have carried it on the parade routes. It's 14 feet long and three feet high, and it has a slogan on it. You know those slogans we like from the past? Like what was Louis St. Just's slogan? All men are brothers. And Karl Marx, working men of all countries unite. And the wide awake Republicans, union, liberty, honor. Sounds good, doesn't it? Hmm. The Republican platform of 1860, internal improvements. That means no bank should be let fail. We have to have all the banks running full time, full bore, and, and, and we've got to take care of housing. My goodness, we better give low interest loans to all the houses. We're going to have internal improvement. This was the bailout program in their day called today uh, corporate welfare. Now that was, the, that was one of the main planks of the Republican platform in 1860. Protective tariffs. We will have the tariffs so high that no country can import anything because we want the businesses in the North to be able to sell their products at whatever price they'd like. So protective tariffs, remember the Republican Party was the party of the North prepared to destroy the South, that's why they were prepared, according to the senator that we just quoted, and one way they were going to do that was by protective tariffs, such a heavy tax on imports that the, the, the businessmen in the North could sell their products at whatever price they wanted, you know, at a high profit range. Hmm. National Bank, they didn't have one at that time, but they said, we've got to have a national bank so the government can control the money. I mean, after all, we might need one and a half trillion dollars to send it over to Europe to bail out the, the IM, you know, the, the uh, what's that, the Euro, <laughs> or whatever reason they wanted the money. They wanted a consolidated national government. Most people have never heard this before, and I thought, why not tell them? Do we have to hide it? Further, the Republican goals became evident. Now, this is by observation. And a few days ago when I was preparing this talk, I thought, I wonder how much I have read on this since I became interested. And I thought, let's see, I've read 30 books, at least 30 books, and they average at least 300 pages per book. What's 30 times 300? 
That's 9,000. I read 9,000. I can't believe that. I thought, I read 9,000? Boy, I wish Mrs. Frisky was here today. Miss Frisky was my second grade teacher <laughs> trying to encourage me to read. <laughs> and I didn't read. I just didn't like reading. But I read 9,000 plus pages about what I'm giving you here and observed these further goals. Establish a unitary republic. Oh, just, where did we hear that before? Well, that was Louis St. Just over in France. That was Karl Marx over there in Germany. They wanted a unitary republic. Use coercion as necessary. Save the geographical union at any cost. That at any cost is not a paraphrase. That's exact language out of the president's speeches. We're going to save the geographical. What did I put geographical in there for? All they were interested in was keeping the geographical boundary intact. It had nothing to do with the rights and liberties of the people in that boundary. Save the geographical union, and it doesn't matter how much it costs, we're going to save it. If we have to destroy every man, woman, and child, and all of their property, we will save the geographical union. That's what it says. I didn't create those words. They did. The Republican Party and their leader. Hmm. They wanted national sovereignty, just like they wanted in Germany and France. Let's go back to this symbol now, Union, Liberty, Honor. I wrote, I wrote an email to the librarian at the Chicago Museum. I says, what do these words mean? And she writes back and says, we don't know. It's just on display out here. This is the Republican banner of 1860. We don't know what it means. By observation, well, I read one book where the man claimed he thinks the eye is the eye of Horus. I have only one source on that. Also known as the Greek god Harpocrates, which was the god of secrecy and silence. Now, the eye, whether or not that means that or not, I don't know. But that possibility exists. Like last night we pointed out, you see something like that, just set it over here in your mind and say that's possible. I don't know if it's true or false. By observation, Union means one nation, indivisible, by coercion. That's what the word union means on the Republican banner of 1860. We will do whatever is possible. We will do anything necessary to maintain the geographical boundary of the union. Liberty means liberté, ou la mort. Huh? Just a minute, Mr. Pratt. Why would you say that the Republicans wanted ou la mort? Well, let's take a look at what they did. Liberty ou la mort. They killed one-fourth of the southern white men between ages 20 and 40. They killed two-fifths of the south's livestock. They destroyed two-thirds of the assessed value of the southern wealth. They destroyed more than half of the farm machinery of the south. And they damaged the railroads and industries beyond calculation. I call that liberté ou la mort. Honor. What does the word honor mean? Well, it certainly means honor the nationalist program. If you didn't honor the nationalist program and you spoke out against it, what happened to you? You don't know probably yet. We'll get into that detail in a little while. I'll just make a brief statement here. If you didn't honor the nationalist program and you spoke out against it, you would be arrested and thrown in prison and held without charges for an indefinite period of time. That reminds me of some place down in Cuba. What's the name of that spot? You know, where, where we incarcerate people that we don't, with no charges, we, we torture them. Guantanamo Bay wasn't the first time we did that. Any northerner guilty of disloyalty to the nationalist program will be put in prison. I'm gonna read a document today I want to read it right out loud in this audience, right from the President of the United States that says that in his words, and he signed it. French Republic poster of 1796. This is the poster. They have the French flag up there. Do you see anything strange down here in this illustration? What are you looking at that you're smiling about? What's this right here? What are they doing with the French flag on the Republican poster? I don't know. All I do is observe. 
I just look and I read and I observe and I say, that flag looks like this flag. I wonder if they had that in mind. Why did Karl Marx, these are two questions this, these authors try to answer. Why did Karl Marx and other socialists find the unionist wor war worthy of their support? Now the word unionist is a kind of a new word to me. I started reading it in some of these books. A unionist was a person who believed in union ou la mort. They were the powerful leaders that wanted central government and they were gonna do whatever they had to to make it happen. Why did Karl Marx, Karl Marx, was he alive then? Oh yeah, he was alive and well. He sent numerous editorials to the Northern newspaper, the New York Tribune, and they published, I think it said 400 editorials written by Karl Marx telling how wonderful it was what the Union was doing. Why did these alien, I highlight that word because J. Reuben Clark said, an alien influence is destroying America. Hmm. Why did these alien radical socialists feel a kinship with the Northern Union and share the desire for the destruction of the South? Why did these socialist communists feel a kinship with the Northern Union? In the New York Sun in the year 1881, okay, now the smoke is cleared, this horrible conflict is over, a few years have gone by. Uh, in 1881, James Garfield is quoted as saying, the influence of Jefferson's democratic principles is rapidly waning, while the principles of Hamilton are rapidly increasing. Power has been gravitating toward the central government. Now what's he talking about here? Jefferson waning, Hamilton increasing, power is gravitating. There's only one part about this statement that's a little weak. Power was not gravitating toward the central government. It was being yanked by the central government and taken into a national sovereignty program. Yanked, not gravitating. Gravitating suggests it's slow. That's an interesting quotation. What were Jefferson's principles? Weren't they the same as Hamilton? Weren't they two great founding fathers on the same cause of liberty? No, no, they were quite opposite in their viewpoints. Hamilton was a nationalist consolidationist. Jefferson believed in government by the consent of the governed. Two contending viewpoints. Hamilton and Jefferson, soon after this, uh, they, were, they were still alive when people started using these words. Oh, that's Hamiltonian thinking. Oh, that's Jeffersonian thinking. And the words today describe two contending forces. So on the 4th of July in Highland, Utah, and in Weber County, and in Provo, Oh, big in Provo, big, big deal in Provo. The 4th of July, 65,000 people get in the stadium and they hoop hurrah. Thousands of people sit on the parade route and watch the parade go by. Oh, it's great to live in America. How wonderful to have the Declaration of Independence. What a great hero is Thomas Jefferson. Hmm. On the 4th of July, we praise Jefferson, but we live in Hamilton's world. We embraced everything Hamilton stood for and rejected everything Jefferson stood for. Really? Check me out. You'll have a lot of fun doing it. <laughs> With other, do your homework. So I put them on the screen here, butting heads, <laughs> because they were two contending viewpoints. Now again, we read from a newspaper in 1900, April the 9th, 1900, the Globe Democrat of St. Louis. The author Edmund, uh, Actually, it's a woman author with a George Edmonds name. Elizabeth Merriweather was the name of the woman. In 1907, she realized she couldn't write a or When did she write the book? Yeah, I think it was 1907. When she wrote the book, she realized it wouldn't be well accepted with a, man, with a woman's name on the cover. Can you believe that? Yeah, so she had to put a makeup name on a man's name on the book so that it might be read and respected. George Edmonds, the real name is Elizabeth Merriweather. Good reading. She writes in there and she says, the Globe Democrat was a Republican newspaper, showing that it's not gonna be biased against Republicans. They say, Lincoln, Grant, and the Union armies gave a victory to Hamiltonism when it subjected the Confederates in the South. So Hamiltonism got a boost when the North used coercion 
liberté ou la mort. The Sovereignty of the States in 1910, the author's trying to explain what happened. This new government was to be made out of the doctrine of implied powers. Under the constructive decisions of the Supreme Court, no restrictions limit the kind of government that may be established under the doctrine of implied powers. John Marshall was the judicial exponent of Alexander Hamilton. So Hamiltonian doctrines were carried on by John Marshall. And the Darwinian concept hadn't been invented yet, but they were already practicing the idea of making the Constitution mean something that it didn't mean. And they used the words implied powers to make it mean something other than what it was designed for. This started way back with John Marshall. Here's John Marshall, Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, 1801 to 1835. He was a consolidationist and a Hamiltonian nationalist. He came up with the idea of judicial review. It is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. Is that the duty of the judicial department? That's what he claimed the duty was. They called it judicial review. The citizens of the states were never sovereign, and therefore they must always yield to the supremacy of the federal government. Have you ever heard anything about the supremacy clause? The federal government, Utah State Legislature passes a law, the Freedom and, the Freedom and Firearms Act. They passed it a year ago. And the state government, or the federal government, sends them a letter saying, hey, you can't do that. We are supreme, it's the supremacy clause. We have power to tell you what to do. Really, is that what the Constitution does? I just can't resist this little children's book. The Old Liberty Bell. My daughter-in-law gave me this about a week ago, and she said, oh, you might enjoy this. She's a good reader, and does lots of reading. Homeschool mother of six. And I read the little book in a few minutes, and it probably took me a half an hour. And on July the 6th, 1835, the bellman was instructed to ring the bell. They used to ring the Liberty Bell for famous people that died. You know, somebody that was really, really a noteworthy person, they'd ring the Liberty Bell for them. Well, guess what happened when they rang the Liberty Bell when John Marshall died? The bell cracked and it never rang again. Well, they can't resist that. <laughs> that just happenstance. <laughs> anyway, John Marshall broke the bell. <laughs> the doctrine of judicial review led to the doctrine of judicial supremacy. Judicial supremacy. The judiciary insists what it says is the law. Here's a, a government website. You can go right to a federal government website. Welcome, choose a grade range to explore. So I choose a grade range and I get this observation. This is Benjamin Franklin teaching us. The Supreme Court stands as the ultimate authority in constitutional interpretation. Its decisions can be changed only by another Supreme Court decision or by a constitutional amendment. Is that true? Absolutely not. That's false propaganda. Here's a Boy Scout manual. I'll preface this remark, please don't leap from your chair, shout heresy, and leave the room. That happened to me. Three high school students, one led the way, jumped from her chair when I showed this slide and read what I'm about to show you. She jumped from her chair and she shouted heresy and led three others out of the room with her. Now, I caution you, please control yourselves. Handle your emotions. Here's what it says. Citizenship in the nation. The Supreme Court has the final authority to interpret the meaning of the Constitution and determine if the law is being applied correctly and fairly. What if the Supreme Court ceases to follow natural law? They didn't leap up at that. They leaped up at what I'm about to show you. What if the Supreme Court ceases to follow natural law and instead begins following the rule of lawmakers? Anybody can fill the blank in? Mentally. Mentally. You got it. <laughs> you got to be mentally awake no matter what you read. If it's the Boy Scout Citizenship in the Nation Merit Badge Handbook and it has false educational ideas, be mentally awake. Be aware that they're false. I taught this to a class of adult leaders in the Boy Scout movement. They were there for training on citizenship in the nation. 
and it didn't go over well. <laughs> there can be no tribunal above the states. The Supreme Court is not above the states. There is no tribunal above the state's authority to decide in the last resort whether the compact made by them be violated. That was the original states' rights doctrine. Of course, it's not respected anymore. There is a great movement going on to bring that back and restore that concept. And uh, it's also a movement that's well aware in, in, in the state legislature of Utah. Well, the Boy Scout handbook is false. That's where the girls got up and walked out. They couldn't handle it anymore. I think their real interest was they wanted to go do something else and they were tired of listening for an hour. And they, that was their humorous way of leaving the room. Law in America, Blair Kaufman, Bonnie Collier, 2001. Today, the Supreme Court of the United States, the nation's highest judicial body, co-equal with the executive and legislative branches of government. Is there any truth in that? No, it's absolutely false. False propaganda, false educational ideas coming from prestigious sources. This is an excellent read. You can Google it and read it for free online. Phyllis Schlafly, a great American woman, she's about 80 now. She was the one that I give credit to for being single-handedly kid-killing the Equal Rights Amendment a few years ago. Do you remember anything about that? Is that all old? But she's a wonderful hero. She writes this great book, and in there she has a chapter, How to Stop Judicial Supremacist. It's good. The Exceptions Clause. Now that's the one Ron Paul is trying to get Congress to use to pass the Sanctity and Life Act. The Exceptions Clause. will tell the Supreme Court what cases they can hear and which they can't hear on appeal. That's what the Exception Clause does. It says Congress has the power over the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is not co-equal with Congress. Congress can tell the Supreme Court what cases they can hear and what cases they can't hear. So let's just have Congress pass a law to stop them from doing the things they don't want them to mess with. This is the approach, and Phyllis does a great job of laying it out. Read online. Eagleforum.org is where you find it. In 1941, this grand old man declared, we are in the midst of the greatest exhibition of propaganda that the world has ever seen. Just do not believe all you read or hear. The elect are being deceived. Now we'll develop that more as the day progresses. The elect are being deceived. From the writings of Adam Weishaupt in the late 1700s, we must bring our opinions into fashion by every art. We must acquire the direction of education. We must win the common people in every corner. This will be obtained chiefly by the means of the schools. He laid out a long program. They were going to control everything they could get their fingers on, including we will publish magazines with uh, illustrations to warp the minds of even those who cannot read. What illustrations were they using? In 1700? What would they do to warp the minds of those of, of the people that cannot read? I used to belong to a wood engravers club. And we could, we could cut pictures in wood that were so complete and in detail, and one of them did, and he published it, and we call that pornography. Huh? On a wooden block and printed on a piece? Of, yes. So they were going to print pornography. This is all part of the program of these geeks. My wife said not to use that. What would I use? Come on, help me out. What word would I give this kind of a character? Thank you. They were going to do everything, including print material that would warp the minds of those who couldn't read. And many people were illiterate at that time. But mainly, they wanted to control the direction of the schools. If we can just get our information into the schools. Now let's take a look at the schools. The Wall Street Journal, May the 14th, 1982. The article was titled, Karl Marx Goes to College. I remember well when I found this article. I was so thrilled, I read it in a magazine. I read about it, I read a quote about it. 
And I thought I need to look at the original newspaper article. At that time, it was not easy. I had to go to a library with microfish or microfilm, whatever they call it, and I had to check out the Wall Street Journal and crank a crank 150 times and find the date and the article. It took probably several hours to find that article and read it for myself, and I did that. Karl Marx goes to college. Thousands of professors are now openly socialist. By the way, the opening statement started out, everyone thinks Karl Marx is dead. He's not. He is alive and well on college campuses today. Thousands of professors are now openly socialist. What topic is most useful to promote their socialist agenda? What's the topic? How do they teach socialism in high school? United States history. That's the one that the editorial pointed out was the most useful tool. And I'd read enough before that I knew he was on target. United States history. I just, a few months ago, had a young teenage girl, she, oh, young, she's 18, and one of my friends from down in Cedar City. She said, would you, would you review my history book and tell me what you think of it? So I obtained her history book online. I read 160 pages of a 950 page book. And in those 160 pages, it averaged one false educational idea per page. Yeah. That means there was a contradiction with another history professor. That's what I mean when I say that. Somebody's given me a false presentation because I find average per page one contradictory statement. So somebody is not telling the truth. United States history is an excellent way to teach false educational ideas. That's one of the reasons the girls shouted heresy and left the room. Here's another example of using the educational system to teach false educational ideas. Published in 2006, The Professors, the 101 Most Dangerous Academics in America by David Horowitz. That's interesting reading. 101 chapters in the book. Every, every professor gets a couple of pages. The book's, the book's about a 500 page book. And he just goes in there and lays out who they are and what they do and how they teach false doctrine in their classrooms all across the country. Another one is the National Education Association. I remember when I attended my first faculty meeting as a college instructor, and they said to me, Pratt, do you want to join the NEA? I don't know. I said, what is it? Oh, it's a way to get good, good insurance rates. Well, yeah, I'll join. I belonged faithfully to the NEA and they automatically deducted it from my salary each year, you know, every month. They deducted my dues to the union. I didn't even know it was a union. No bother, nobody bothered to tell me that and I never bothered to ask. I just kept paying my dues because I got better insurance rates. Wow, what a sleazy outfit. This is from Phyllis Schlafly, by the way. She summarizes in one of her newsletters some of the things they approved in 2011 as their resolutions and their goals for the NEA. Diversity training beginning with preschoolers in GLBT. Well, what's that? Gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender education in preschool. These are resolutions that passed in 2011. Tax-funded abortions. Devotion to unratified United Nations treaties. It doesn't matter if the Congress, you know, passed or made. We just follow them, like environmental nonsense. Insist on pre-kindergarten for age three and older. The earlier we can start, the sooner we can start, the sooner we can pervert their minds. That was Adam Weishaupt's viewpoint. Exclude parents from control of sex education. I remember my, my bishop asked me, Brother Pratt, uh, this was like 30, 40 years ago. The bishop, he, I was his counselor, and he says, Brother Pratt, uh, we understand there's something down at the school district that they want to have a representative from each religion send so they can get our viewpoint. Would you go represent our church there? Yeah, sure, sure. And they showed me a film, and it had an egg, and it showed how the little baby chicken was hatched in the egg. Oh, it's so pure and beautiful. I didn't know it was sex education. Wow, 
They got done. Is everybody in favor of this? Oh, yeah, yeah, our, our church supports this. Yeah, fully. Yeah. I don't know. A week later, I read Marky e. Peterson's rebuttal of it. But I was too late. I'd already voted yes. <laughs> Stupidity on my part. Lack of understanding. Exclude parents from control of sex education is a 2011 goal. Stop homeschooling unless parents are licensed. I'm a second generation homeschooler. My grandchildren are being homeschooled in two families. We love it. We realize that there is no one influencing these children except mom and dad in the school situation. And grandpa, oh, I get a chance too. <laughs> I love homeschooling. It's the hope of the future. Stop homeschooling unless all the parents are licensed by the government. Family planning clinics in public schools. Elect Democratic candidates. We don't want Republicans. These are all things they passed at the NEA. Strict regulation of guns. Oh, we don't want anybody to own firearms. That'd be horrible. And so forth. Now, that's the so forth. It goes on. There are more. I just gave you a sampling from Phyllis Schlafly's newsletter. Where did George Washington's country go? Do you remember George Washington, the father of our country? Where did his country go? Well, we're going to find out this afternoon, right after our lunch break. We're going to go into a lesson that will, if you're still here, if you even come back after what I told you this morning, you'll hear the rest of the story. Where did George Washington's country go? Joe Sobrand summed it up like this. The United States Constitution poses no serious threat to our form of government today. That's a good stopping point. <laughs>